Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, my name is Gidi. Before I begin, just a quick shout out to my wonderful colleagues that were already mentioned, uh, people ranging from mathematics to computer science to uh, biblical scholarship. Uh, today, I'm going to present some uh, first results of our uh, dabbling in the mystery of uh, surrounding the uh, coming to be of the Hebrew Bible. I'm not going to read the title of the talk, it's not very important, but I would like to draw your attention to two carefully chosen words, specifically statistical exploration rather than authorship attribution, authorship verification, or the rebuttal of the existence of God. So uh, specifically, does it work? Yeah, specifically, uh, we're going to be concerned with uh, the origin of the Pentateuch, the Torah, or the five books of Moses, call it what you will, and try to determine whether, uh, whether it's a, can, can we see? Whether it's a single, united, and cohesive text, or alternatively, a, comp a compilation of different textual constituents that bear trace of different scribal traditions, different uh, theological themes, and most interestingly and importantly, uh, traces of being com uh, composed in different uh, uh, sp spots in time and space, space-time, as uh, we call it in physics. Um, right, and the question is, wh why would we even want to ask uh, to consider these two options to begin with, with the text so uh, solidly advocates for the first option Right? And for that, I have to take you to the late uh, 17th century, where one Baruch Spinoza, a Jewish, uh, uh, a Jewish philosopher, started examining the Bible in an objective and critical manner. And then he found numerous discontinuities in the text, inconsistencies, and doublets. So as an example, I take you to Genesis 7.17, talks about the uh, Noah's flood. And the verse says, Abul arba'im yom al aretz. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And if we go but seven verses down the text, it's very close textually. We have another verse depicting the same event. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So we have two different accounts of the same event that are also contradictory found in the same text. So what is happening here? And uh, this, these... All these issues were addressed in the thesis of one Julius Wellhausen in the latter part of the 19th century, whose thesis was essentially that the Bible is a compilation of different distinct textual uh, sources. Uh, but which sources are they? So what he essentially did is, oh, we cannot see it. Um, he uh, essentially addressed the Bible as a, as a, a pie chart and split this pie chart into uh, different, different pieces of the pie, where every piece is an independent or rather independent textual constituent. Uh, he did this by performing linguistic, philological, semantic analysis, and so forth. And since uh, this Julius Wellhausen, there came a lot, a lot of people to this day. Each had, has their own uh, combination of these methodologies of splitting the biblical pie into uh, into different constituents, and this uh, hot mess is proudly known today as biblical exegesis or biblical scholarship. Now, why is all this interesting? This is interesting uh, specifically for our case that all of these people who usually disagree on just about anything do happen to agree on one specific piece of the biblical pie, uh, known namely as the priestly source, and we will refer to it as P. Uh, and the agreement on which parts of uh, the Pentateuch belongs to the source is about 97%. We counted it ourselves. And again, this is based on different analyses of uh, many different people. Now, why is this interesting for us? Because it's, it gives us a good opportunity to explore this agreement via a computational and statistical lens and see if there are any objective features that can show why such a wide agreement specifically on this constituent exists. Now, this is uh, a scheme just to help us to get along, uh, to understand what we're w working against. Every column in the scheme is a verse. We have many more verses than the 80-something, 50, 58 or so verses shown here, but this is just 
to wrap our minds along, uh, around what we're, uh, what we're dabbling with. Uh, the color of each column, of each verse, represents of whether or not uh, the scholarship attributes this verse to be belonging to P, to the priestly source, or not P. So we have a partition of two colors, right? Which texts are considered P, and which texts are considered not P. And the hypothesis that we make in our study is as follows. So red is considered as the priestly source, whereas green are other sources, non P. We're not going to try to discern other difference, uh, different, different sources, but rather just the priestly against non priestly. And these two blocks are considered distinct for some reason. We don't know which, uh, what reason it is yet. And the second hypothesis is that red, uh, the red and green blocks are written by culturally, geographically, or chronologically distinct authors. And this difference should be able, should be, should manifest itself also by the grammatical or uh, structure or the vocabulary use of these two blocks of text. Now, the objective of the study, first of all, is we want to try to explore this hypothesized distinction computationally by using unsupervised uh, learning, clustering, according to different literary parameters, which I will, uh, I will detail in just a moment. And then we want to compare the hypothesized partition of P and non-P, the, re uh, the red and green, with the unsupervised partition and see whether how big the overlap between the two is. The second objective would be to quantify the statistical significance of our result, and I will, this is maybe the most important caveat of this talk, and I will uh, explore on it in a moment, essentially to prove that the signal is real and it's not some random uh, feature of, of our data. And thirdly, we want to interpret our results. This is all in connection to uh, yesterday's workshop, where we want to identify and quantify the importance that are responsible for this literary difference this could be words, this could be specific grammatical structure, and so on. Now, how do we do that? So first of all, we consider the following literary parameters. These are simple, very basic observables in a natural language processing, NLP. We have two representation, different representations of the text. One, uh, a lexematic representation, which is a reminiscent, say, of vocabulary. And the second is by part of speech tags, we call it uh, PDPs. Right, so we have a grammatical and a vocabulary-wise uh, representation of the text. This is a first parameter. Second, uh, we embed the text mathematically using TFIDF. I guess I don't have to explain to anybody what it means, but if there are any questions, then I warmly refer you to the, uh, to the paper. Uh, the second parameter that we choose is the n-gram size, so we can choose multiple uh, si n-gram sizes by which to embed the text. And the third is the running window of verses. And what, what it means is essentially that a single verse, a single unit of text, may not have sufficient context to have a statistical merit and be uh, correctly attributed to either of the two clusters. So we have to look at the verses surrounding it. And the running window parameter essentially tells us how many verses around the verse, that, uh, the verse of interest we have to look at. So for example, a running window of one would turn verse two into verse two surrounded by two other verses. And then uh, our goal is essentially to find a combination of these parameters that would achieve the highest overlap, that would achieve the highest agreement with the hypothesized P non P partition, right? This is an unsupervised exercise. So at no point does the algorithm know of the hypothesized partition, but we simply compare the results with, uh, with that. And this is what it looks like, so let me walk you through this plot. This, uh, please focus first on just the left matrix. Uh, the x-axis are different n-gram sizes that we probed. The y-axis are different uh, running window widths that we probed. And basically this matrix is a combination right, of all these uh, possible parameters. This is for the book of Exodus in a part of speech representation. So the numbers in each cell represent in percents the amount of agreement between the unsupervised and the hypothesized uh, uh, labels that we get. Essentially, the, the two partitions are compared and their agreement is quantified in percent. We can see that there is a whole range of combinations of parameters here that yield about 90% of agreement between the hypothesized P non P and the unsupervised partition. 
uh, the right matrix is the standard deviation matrix for every cell. It basically tells us how sure we are of this number. This is a result of a bootstrap-like uh, procedure to, just to test the statistical stability of this experiment. And now uh, I want to address the probably most important part of this, of this talk, which is how, how do we validate that this number is really something that is significant and not some uh, random that we would essentially get a 90% agreement with any garbage uh, partition that we would test. Now, um, I'm not sure, I wasn't sure how well-versed everybody is in this room in hypothesis testing, so I prepared this little slide with a uh, relevant, say, um, real, real, recent real-life example. So the goal, of, uh, the goal of this example is essentially we want to test the effectivity of a COVID-19 vaccine. The test that we are going to run to check whether or not it's effective is to uh, check the effect of the vaccine versus a placebo group, right? People that get something that is not the vaccine and see if there is a significant difference in behavior between these two groups. The setup of the experiment would be essentially have two groups of people, right? One group that are given the vaccine and the other group that are given the placebo. Uh, and then we essentially calculate, for example, the number of not hospitalized people out of 100 people. Okay, this is, uh, I hope this, was, uh, this, uh, this makes sense. And we get something like this. So the, uh, the gray curve is essentially the distribution of many groups of 100 people, right? And these are the numbers of people that did not get hospitali hospitalized out of 100 people. And the red column is the average of the people that did get the vaccine. So from, the, from, from this distribution, this is uh, referred to as the null distribution, we can calculate the uh, probability that the people uh, who did get the vaccine come from the distribution of the people who didn't get the vaccine. So in this case, as you can see, the chances are very low. This is really far removed from this distribution. And uh, essentially, it means that the COVID vaccine works with a very high probability. This means that it has a very low p-value. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain what a uh, low p-value is. So, but how is this relevant to our case? So what we're going to ask in our context is maybe we get, so we saw that we got 90% uh, agreement, for example, between p and non-p in the book of Exodus. But what happens if we test it with some random labels and not the hypothesized label. What happens if we get a 95% agreement with some garbage labels? It means that the signal is not statistically significant, and this is what we want to test. So the assumption is, as I said, that the expert labeling, the labels of the uh, biblical scholars, is random. It's not, it doesn't represent anything real. And the test to prove with what is the probability of this to be, to be so is a, a permutation of uh, labels. Essentially, we just mess up with these red and green labels and do this entire experiment over, over and over again. We get this matrix, we take the best value of this matrix, and we ge generate our null distribution as, oh, really? Damn. Uh, and as a null distribution uh, out of this. However, Here's a question to you. Does this labeling seem random to you? No, it, do it doesn't, right? It's potentially biased by some correlations between adjacent verses. So if we have a block of verses that are talking about the same thing or have some genre-like proximity, then we get something like that, right? That a block of text are uh, labeled red and some a block of text are labeled green. And the conclusion is that the null hypothesis where we just mess up with the labels is too naive. That's exactly the case that was presented in the workshop yesterday, that we get very good p-values even if we, sh that we shouldn't get. And the remedy uh, for that is that we assume a different null hypothesis, that instead of the labeling being random, we rather assume that the labeling is caused due to some unrelated correlation between verses that don't have this, don't bear this uh, stylistic signal, just are caused by some uh, semantic, uh, semantic similarities. And the test, uh, and the remedy to this is uh, perform another, not a permutation test, but a cyclic shift test where we just conserve the structure of the hypothesized labeling and shift it uh, in the shift it cyclically. That just, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have don't have a 
uh, a graphic for that. But then uh, we get a much more prohibitive uh, now distribution, uh, which, which means that uh, essentially our hypothesis test is considerably more conservative for this case than uh, a simple random permutation test. And we have a much more rigorous approach coming underway. Hopefully, we will be uh, able to present it soon. Now, the last thing uh, in our pipeline is to extract the features that are responsible for some partition. We want to see which features are responsible for these two groups, say the P and non-P clusters, to be as different as, as possible. So we leverage on some mathematical properties that are listed in the paper of uh, the embedding and uh, the k-means algorithm, which we use for the unsupervised clustering, uh, which allows us to extract features that make the difference. It's unlike some abundance analysis of the most frequent features in each cluster that may be identical in both. We we'll rather extract the features that are responsible for the difference between the two clusters. And we can associate these features to either the p-cluster or the non-p-cluster. Uh, and we get something like this. So yeah, it's obviously uh, it's too small to notice. Essentially, what is the uh, what we see here is a bar plot. Every bar here is a feature, is uh, ranked by their importance to, uh, for example, the P cluster. These are uh, uh, th uh, these are trigrams of words that are associated with a Priestley uh, cluster leading to this 90% agreement, you can see that the importance of the feature to uh, this cluster are uh, given by the height of this bar. And there is a lot of considerable more uh, analysis concerning the linear combinations of these features. And it's not just the individual features that are important, but rather the linear combinations. Unfortunately, I don't have time to address them. But let's look at how long do I have? Two more minutes, okay, good. So let's uh, look at some results. So first of all, for the book of Genesis, we get an optimal overlap of 78%, the p-value of 8%, so it's, it's pretty significant. So we shown that really the p and non-p signal is the strongest given our, uh, given our analysis. Uh, we find p-associated features such as uh, the talk of chronology, genealogy, third-person narration, things that, are, that were uh, identified by scholars to be associated with this, uh, with this uh, con textual constituent. For Exodus, we get a 90% agreement, as you saw, for uh, uh, both representations of part of speech and vocabulary with a lower p-value, so it's even more significant than that. And the, uh, what we found is essentially a distinct two big blocks of P-associated material in the book of Exodus concerning the building of the tabernacle. So these are like instructions of how to build and how to worship in the tabernacle. So this is essentially a no-brainer. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude very briefly. So uh, we introduce this novel uh, stylometric methodology, or rather the first steps thereof, uh, where we optimize, perform hypothesis testing and interpretability analysis. We attempt to explore the style of the priestly constituents in the book of Genesis and Exodus independently. Uh, for, we get 78% and 98% optimal overlap with uh, both books respectively. Both are statistically significant signals. Uh, and it, when, if, if we want to give any, uh, say, biblical, uh, like exegetical um, interpretation of our results, much of it is in the paper, what we essentially find is that P and non-P text are not distinct in terms of, say, grammatical or small grammatical structure, but P itself is, introduces a distinct genre, speaking about, for example, law giving instruction, very technical uh, language, st streamlining some historical events and realities, trying to present like a bigger picture from creation, for example, to the death of Moses, genealogies, this, the son of this, the son of this, the son of this. And essentially all of these together, they comprise of a distinct genre that the priestly author uh, was concerned with. Yeah, and with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and we'll be happy to take questions.